Now here's a part two of the lecture. Let's start with talking about the uh, temporomandibular joint, often known as TMJ. So this is the only synovial joint that you can find in the human kind of a head and facial area. Everything else is suture joint. This is the articulation between mandible here and temporal bone. Taking a little bit closer look, again, this is the synovial joint. Considered as a modified hinge joint. Yes, it opens and closes. It has this nice hinge motion, but it's considered as modified hinge joint. And here's the reason why. Your TMJ is actually a very complicated joint. What you have inside of this joint is you see this nice articular disc, small piece of cartilage sitting in, in the middle. Okay. And this disc is separating the joint into a sorry, superior compartment here as well as the inferior compartment here. So virtually, you actually have two different joints. One between the temporal bone and this disc, and second joint between this disc and mandible joint. Over the superior compartment, the motion that you have is a gliding motion, so gliding forward and gliding it back. So if you are to protrude your lower jaw forward or back, all this motion, gliding motion, is happening over here over the superior compartment. Inferior compartment here is responsible for hinge motion. So this condylar right here has a responsibility to rotate in and out this way, in and out, back and forth, like a, like a rocking chair. So it has the ability to open and close your jaw. Okay. So combining together, you have a lot of mobility. Okay, at this TMJ joint because you virtually have two different joints. TMJ myology, you have a very, very strong group of muscles for mastication. Um, the big one here is the temporalis muscle as well as masseter. You can actually place your fingers over this area, that area, and open and close your jaw to really feel the contractions. Those two muscles are ridiculously strong. Okay. And you have smaller, uh, much deeper muscles known as medial and lateral pterygoid muscle. They also work together to close your jaw. These four muscles, you don't have to remember origin and insertion. Only thing that I want you to know is innovation and action. So for innovation, you should know that all these muscles are innovated by cranial nerve number five, trigeminal. And the action of that is mastication, chewing. TMJ dysfunction. This is a condition of the TMJ. When you hear the word dysfunction, it virtually means, well, something is not functioning correctly. So it could be anything from maybe post-traumatic TMJ dysfunction. Maybe you experienced a, a dislocation of this joint and start to develop some dysfunction later or muscle related. Maybe those muscles that we just talked about are in spasm and you cannot move TMJ because it's a constant pressure and tension. Joint related, maybe some people would develop osteoarthritis within a TMJ and can lead to TMJ dysfunction. Emotional stress is a very interesting one, but when you are stressed, when you're under the stress, you have a tendency to bite down and then creating the constant compressive force across the TMJ. So that can actually lead to TMJ dysfunction as well. Possible findings, people would often experience tension-like headache kind of across the head as well as the earache because they're so close with each other and sometimes the pain can radiate down to the neck and shoulder pain because if you're creating some tension over here you also gotta create some tension over the um, upper trap as well as the levator scap so maybe those muscles can also go into spasm if they're to open and close their jaw nice and wide some people might experience some clicking with the motion Typical reason why is that um, this joint, um, particular disc right here, is supposed to be nice and flat, and basically laying in between those two bones. But sometimes that disc can get jammed in front or maybe towards the back. So this jammed or bent disc can cause some locking of the joint and sometimes clicking and popping. Molar collusion. It might be difficult for them to say um, close their jaw all the way and then bite down evenly. Hyper or hypermobility is a possibility. Hyper, 
permobility, especially if they sustain a temporal mandibular joint dislocation, maybe they've stretched the ligaments out, or maybe they stretch the joint capsule out, they might develop hypermobility. Hypomobility, maybe due to osteoarthritis or maybe muscle spasm, they can maybe lose the mobility of the TMJ. How are you going to manage it? Really depending on the cause. If it's hypermobility, you might want to consider strengthening the muscles. But typically, those muscles are still very strong, though, unless you are looking at the older population. Hypomobility, in order for you to facilitate the mobilization of the TMJ, you might be able to perform joint moves. Um, ice is also a possible treatment for, for a pain, more pain than anything else. Rest is going to be important. So some of the bad case might require temporary mobilization. That probably means that they cannot eat anything solid for, for maybe a couple days or so. They might need to uh, be on a soft diet. TMJ dysfunction is not a life-threatening condition, but think about this. Every time you try to speak, every time you try to eat something, it's going to bother you. So this is going to affect this health-related quality of life of the patient significantly. It's not a fun condition to deal with. TMJ dislocation, something like this. Um, I've seen this injury once before and then it was almost funny because this is what typically you're gonna see depending on which direction the patient is experiencing the dislocation. If it's inferior dislocation, their face is going to look longer. If it's lateral dislocation, then the lower jaw mandible is going to be looking deviated to one side. Their jaw is typically locked in the position, they lose the ability to move, and then they're gonna have some severe, severe pain. And think about this massive spasm that they're gonna have to deal with. Here's an, another x-ray. This is also a picture of the inferior dislocation. This is a cone dial the mandible, supposed to be right over here, but it's been slipped down. So all these spasms, all these muscles gonna be going to spasms which is going to lead to massive pain here as well as the headache and they might experience nausea as well if this is suspected you should refer this patient immediately but you also have to think about okay how does this happen typically how this happens is when they're opening the jaw slightly they maybe get like elbowed to their lower jaw and then they, they sustain a dislocation whenever patients sustain the impact to their face you should also think about the possibility of a concussion. So this one case that I've seen before, this patient had a lot on dislocation, but also had a massive concussion with it. After reduction, he started to throw up and we have to deal with the concussion that he sustained as well as the massive spasm that he got from the dislocation. It was not a fun case. It was a good case, learning case for me, but not a fun case for the athlete. Tooth fracture. Depending on which layer is being involved, um, the management is going to be a little bit different. But here's a little tooth anatomy. Superficial layer here is known as NML. Dentin is the next layer. And pulp cavity, you can find a lot of nerve and artery and vein. So if you fracture, say if you get maybe elbowed or something like that and then got your teeth chipped a little bit. If it's just affecting the NML layer, typically not painful. You don't have much of a symptoms. You just kind of look bad. If the damage starts to extend towards the dentin layer, that's when the patient will start to develop some sensitivity to cold or hot and maybe some pain. If the fracture is extending towards the pulp, we call that as a complicated fracture. If the pulp is being exposed, yeah, a patient's gonna have some severe pain, severe sensitivity, and this is a really bad case of affecting the root. So how are you going to deal with it depending on how bad the fracture is? But it's not really my safe place as an athletic trainer to determine what needs to be done. So if it's not, if it's obviously shallow, I may not refer. But if I'm afraid that it might start to affect a little deeper layer such as dentin, I should consider referral and this patient may not have to do anything again if it's just the nml layer if it's affecting deeper layer maybe capping or bridging or worst case scenario root canal might be required tooth lacusations sometimes uh, somebody's teeth could get knocked out maybe just really really start to become unstable or completely evolved depending on the case uh, patient will often experience massive pain and massive bleeding first of all Pick this up, try to find it, okay, pick it up. 
next thing you kinda have to do, you need to try to re-implant this tooth as soon as possible. For this injury, every second, every minute matters. Because if you don't do that right away, this tooth right there will start to die and they're gonna end up losing this tooth. You're gonna have to react right away. Now, if you're talking about, you know, this tooth maybe um, fell over in a relatively clean area, you can just immediately attempt to re-implant. But if you happen to find this tooth over in a baseball field or a football field and maybe covered with dirt, you're gonna have to rinse it off, okay? You can use either plain water or saline solution to rinse it off if needed. If it's clean, you don't even have to do it, okay? The less clean you're gonna have to do, the better. First thing you can do, if you're gonna use soap or peroxide or try to scrape this, Okay, you can actually start to kill this tooth. You can accelerate the process, but please do not do that. The most you're gonna have to do is just rinse it off. And try to replant again as soon as possible, try to pull it back. But let's say it just keeps falling, it's not successful. If that's the case, you're gonna have to now make an immediate referral, but you have to consider, okay, I need to find a way to save this tooth. There are a couple different ways for you to do this. Best thing would be having this saber tooth kit. Now, this little small container has specific special type of fluid inside, so all you need to do is just place in this tooth in this fluid and send this patient to the dentist's office as soon as possible. If you don't have this in your kit, then the next best thing you can use is going to be the whole milk or the saline solution. Please do not use water because it's going to, again, kill the tooth. Okay. If you don't have anything like this in your kit or in your office, then the next best thing you can do is to place this tooth in between the cheek and gum of the patient. Now, of course, tell them not to swallow, okay? But this is gonna be much better environment for the tooth to stay alive compared to water. Management while they're being transported, you might wanna consider um, controlling the ble uh, bleeding. And also, if because they received some kind of impact to the face, suspect a concussion. Throat injury, anything from contusion to fracture is a possibility. Not very common, but when they're expanding the cervical spine and throat is exposed and something is going to hit this area, that's certainly a possibility. In really rare cases, it could obstruct the airway and then cause some life-threatening condition. But if it just contusion, maybe some of the signs of symptoms that you're gonna see is hardness. May, they may not be able to speak clearly. They might experience some dyspenia, which is difficulty or painful. This penia is breathing, coughing, difficulty swallowing, or inability to say high pitch e sound. They might experience some spasm in the throat area, which also might lead to respiratory distress in some severe cases. Now, when whenever the patient is experiencing something like this, dyspenia it's easy for people to start to panic. I mean, it's, it's they're having a difficult time breathing. So definitely one thing you can do is try to calm them down, try to reassure them, try to um, tell them that they have control over their breathing and calm down, slow it down, um, and refer if it's a severe throat injury. One severe case of throat injury that I wanna share, I don't know how many of you actually remember this case or know this case. This particular athlete right here, he was a football player at the South Carolina University. University of South Carolina, sorry. He was playing football. So one day back in 2009, he was bench pressing about 275 pounds, which was kind of a nothing kind of a weight for him. It really wasn't that heavy. But for some reason, this weight slipped from his hands and he has spotters, but it just happened too fast that they could not catch it. What happened was um, he dropped this weight over his throat which crushed his landing into uh, and it split into two parts, two different pieces. So he was rushed to the hospital, but even the physician did not know what to do because typically when a physician sees a case like this car accident, it's a fatal car accident that they don't even have to say do anything. But this was such a isolated throat injury. It only affected his throat and they never seen a case like this before. So. They were looking at all these kind of broken different pieces of cartilage and then going like hmm what should we do so they ended up um putting these pieces back together they needed to hurry because if they're doing this too slow then stefan is going to start to swallow some of the pieces and then his larynx is never going to get the same not never going to get um healed 
so they were kind of in a rush to put all these pieces together so they reconstructed his throat and put a lot of tubes inside so once um, Stefan woke up from the surgery the physician told him do not talk do not cough do not move um, so he was in a tube, the big tube, for a little bit of a time, and then he started to get really better. He listened to the physician. He didn't cough. He didn't talk. He didn't try to speak. Uh, so the tube got smaller and smaller and smaller every day, and eventually he recovered completely um, and was able to play NFL at least for a little bit of a time. So this is the end for part two, and then part three lectures coming up soon.